They're brothers, but so were Cain and Abel. They were into porn, they were into drugs, they were into anything they could get their hands on to make money. They're just nouveau riche dumbasses. Committing deadly sins is the Pirano family's bread and butter. Deep Throat was considered to be the most profitable film of all time. They stopped counting it. They started weighing the money. That's how much money they were making. When this nuclear family goes ballistic, it's cause their greed is way thicker than their blood. I had never heard of a betrayal like that. One person that has absolutely nothing to do with this gets killed. It's devastating. My name is Steve Sharippa. I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. I've seen good people turn bad and bad people turn worse. Some took contracts to carry out a hit. Some were victims of a hit. To hit men, life and death is just part of the business. It's nothing personal. January 4th, 1982, Brooklyn, New York. Joseph Pirano and his son, Joe Jr., are going to a meeting with their Colombo crime family bosses. What they don't know is they're heading into an ambush. What makes it even worse is the plan to kill them has been hatched by Joe Sr.'s business partner, his big brother, Tony. I had never heard of a betrayal like that, where a brother would actually come in and ask that his brother and his nephew be killed. To me, it was unbelievable. So how did the relationship between two brothers turn into carnage? Every family has its disputes. Bickering over money can lead to hard feelings, for sure. So. What if you and your brother own the most profitable porn flick ever made? Deep Throat. We're talking about tens, maybe hundreds of millions. And what if your lying, cheating, nincompoop of a brother, what if that fat, no good pile of crap stole tens of millions of that movie's profits from you and your family? Would you want him dead? Yeah, I thought so. I think the family kind of fractured, as families do when they start making tons and tons and tons of money. It all started in happier days. It's the early 70s. Joe Pirano is a gangster from a gangster family. And life is good. Joe isn't especially smart or ambitious, but his big brother, Tony, let some tag along. Each of them was a member of the Colombo crime family, and they were involved in the typical gangster uh, activities, loan sharking, gambling, extortion. They were thugs and hoodlums, you know, street people. They didn't have any finesse. <laughs> they were into anything they could get their hands on to make money. Salvatore Big Sal Michiata is on the same mafia crew as Joe and Tony Pirano. He doesn't much like either one. They were bullies, very loud, very boisterous type people. In the Colombo family, nobody liked them at all. They aren't exactly peas from a pod. Melons would be more like it. Elder brother Tony is the brains. He was in a 400 pound area, so that they nicknamed him Fat Tony Pirano. Big as Fat Tony might be, if he's the brains, then Joe's the stomach. They call him the whale. But not all of his blubber is on his waistline. Plenty of it is between his ears. No one had a nice thing to say about Joe the whale, other than he was fat and he couldn't fit in the doorway. The brothers have a nice little racket making dirty movies that play to perverts and peep shows. The home video revolution is years away, and Hollywood movies are prudish. So porn fans have to take whatever garbage they can get. And make no mistake, what the Piranos make is crap. 
There was basically loops, which are short films. They'd be really grainy, and they, they weren't shot really well. You really couldn't see a lot of what was going on in, in the films. Um, they weren't that good. Still, low budgets and a black market product make the brothers a steady profit. And they control the whole shebang, especially in their hometown. Times Square was really a cesspool. It was all pornographic theaters, peep shows, prostitutes. Today, you couldn't buy a loose cigarette in Times Square. Then you could buy almost anything your heart desired. The theaters paid at least 50% of their income to the mob, or to the mob through the Perenos. You would think to the mob, money is money. But even gangsters have standards, and to them, the Piranos are just as skanky as their wares. Pornography was thought to be the lowest rung of organized crime. When I was inducted into the family, the Colombo family, I was explicitly told that there was nothing to be done in the pornography business. We were not to be involved in it was one of the rules and regulations that needed to be followed. Remember, these guys are very heavily Catholic, and they have wives, and the wives are always saying, why are you making those dirty movies, you know? Those things would be disgusting. They would be dishonorable to be involved in anything like that. The mafia that I joined would have had not, nothing to do with that kind of industry. The fact that their crew looks down on porn makes it easy for Tony and Joe to keep it all in the family. They both have sons, and in both cases, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Tony's son, Butchie, is like his father. He's smart and has a good head for business. Butchie had a reputation as being a charming, roguish kind of a character. He was one of these guys that really knew how to hang out in New York and, you know, have fun. You know, he was a fun guy, and everyone liked him. Butchie dreams of turning his family's porn racket into a Hollywood hit factory, with him at the helm. He wanted to be an auteur, you know? He really wanted to be this filmmaker and make big Hollywood features, you know, not just, you know, pornography. Joe the Whale's son, Joe Jr., is nothing like his cousin, Butchie. Junior's a bonehead who coasts on his connections, just like his old man. It would be difficult for you to have a real conversation with them. They didn't know anything about the movie industry or anything like that. The fortunes of the Pereno brothers change one day when into their office strolls a guy with an idea that will revolutionize the smut industry. Gerard Damiano is a New York hairdresser who wants to be a movie director. And his earth-shaking idea is to make a dirty feature film. You know, a story, people talking, pretending to be other people, the whole bit. Back in those days, you know, that was really unheard of. You know, X-rated films were shot in a hotel room with a couple of hookers. You know, that was the film. Damiano even has a star in mind. He's written a porno comedy for a woman who has a very special talent. Her name is Linda Lovelace. It's no accident he calls his movie Deep Throat. He was inspired by Linda Lovelace, there's no question. I think really what struck my father about uh, Linda was her innocence, that it was almost a contradiction. Here was someone with this, you know, amazing sexual technique but that had the appeal of the girl next door. At first, the girl next door appeal is lost on the Piranos. He had a big, big fight with the Piranos because they didn't think Linda was attractive. And, and Gerard Damiano would scream back, but Deep Throat's going to become a household word. You know, they didn't quite get it. They didn't understand what he was trying to do. Um, for example, they didn't like the title. They wanted to call it The Sword Swallower. And he had to convince them, no, no, trust me, you know, Deep Throat. They're also nervous that Deep Throat's budget is about $22,000. That's 15 times the cost of a porn loop. 
So $22,000 to make this movie with this not very attractive girl, well, they really didn't know what they were doing. The Perinos are not impressed with Linda. And Damiano insists they at least bring her in for an audition. But when they experience her special talent firsthand, let's just say they have a change of heart. Linda Lovelace's special talent, and this is hard to say on a PG-rated show, but she uh, could perform fellatio. I don't mean to be crude, but that was her selling point. Deep throat was kind of a sex technique people hadn't heard of or seen. There was no word deep throat until the movie. And people wanted to see that. Hey, Junior, go After Linda's trip to the casting couch, the Piranos agreed to bankroll Damiano's deep throat. My father was responsible for all creative aspects of the film. The Piranos were responsible for distribution and, of course, the funding and they were gonna split the profits three ways. He went home and wrote the script over the weekend, and by Monday, he went back and showed this to the Perinos and said, this is the film I wanna make. Miami, winter 1972. Damiano takes just six days to shoot his movie. My father, he did everything in that movie except get laid. He came up with the idea, wrote the script. He did the editing. He was involved in every aspect of that, of that film from beginning to end. At the time, I was seven years old. We were on the set, and the atmosphere was um, very exciting. You know, my father never allowed us to be anywhere near um, what they called the nitty gritty. When they were filming the sex scenes, we were ushered, you know, off the set. But, um, you know, we were very aware that our father was a filmmaker and, and we were proud of that, you know, and, and we were, were raised to believe that there wasn't anything wrong with, uh, with sexuality. The big question is, will it make money? Oh boy, will it? Deep Throat goes on to become the most profitable porn film ever made. Tony and Joe Pereno and their sons, Butchie and Joe Jr., are poised to become mega millionaires. Their family fortune is built on a foundation of lies, exploitation, and threats of violence. What could possibly go wrong? January 1982. The new year is just four days old, and mobsters slash porn distributors Joseph the World Pirano and his son are on their way to a meeting. What the two Joes don't know is the sit down is a setup. Who they'll be meeting is their maker. <laughs> Ten years earlier, it seemed like the fun would never end for the Pirano brothers. Their film Deep Throat opens in 72, and it hits at just the moment. Mr. and Mrs. America are thinking they need to explore their wild side. It was just the perfect movie at the perfect time. People had been talking about having sex in the 60s, but nobody really had it until the 70s. People were ready for a porn revolution. In Tucson, future porn legend Annie Sprinkle is working the popcorn counter at the local movie house. Deep Throat was the first porn movie I had ever seen, and the first porn movie a lot of people had seen. And I remember just being totally awed, shocked, amazed, seeing, you know, genitals big on the screen. It was a religious experience. <laughs> the reason why Deep Throat made it was because it was a comedy. Uh, 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 uh. Well, there it is, you little bugger, there it is. It was a lot of fun. So people came from all walks of life. Linda Lovelace was on the cover of Esquire. Johnny Carson started making jokes. Once Johnny Carson includes it in his monologue, 
you know, you're set. Deep Throat was happening. It was the film to see, and everyone was going to see it. And I remember working in that ticket booth and just the cash coming through. It was unbelievable. I couldn't sell tickets fast enough. The success of Deep Throat means the Pirano brothers go from bottom-feeding pariahs to filthy rich, big-time earners for the Colombo crime family. The Piranos revolutionized the porn business and brought the mob into it in a big way. The mob is like a chameleon. They're always changing. They always want to supply whatever it is to the people, whatever they want. And as society changed, they changed right along with it. Publicly, uh, the mafia has always been against pornography, but they're in the life to make money. When porn became big, the mob was standing right there, ready to give them whatever they wanted. It was just making so much money. And the rest of the mafia realizes that it's like it's a product like drugs were to the mafia in the 50s, that they could make hundreds of millions of dollars. It's like heroin. So basically, everyone started making porn films. You know, anybody that believed in the old folklore and all the old stuff about honor and integrity, that was all gone by the wayside. It's like a whirlwind, like the tornado was taking over. The mob was absolutely out of the honor business, and it was strictly a money-making enterprise now. Pucci produced the film, but it's Tony and Joe's distribution network that makes Deep Throat such a winner. Their approach is classic mafia, simple and blunt. They didn't just send the film out and go buy box office receipts. They had their own people there to make sure they got every dollar. A guy would fly the prints in, give it to the theater owners, and say, we want 50% of this at the end of the week. They want to make sure their numbers were accurate. So I think people got a few bucks an hour to sit there at the door counting how many people went in. So they had a very tight control on the distribution. This method is so effective, the Pirano's office is soon swamped with cash. They stopped counting it. They started weighing the money. That's how much money they were making. There was money from the floor to the ceiling, and they didn't want to leave because they were afraid the place would get broken into. If there is a break-in, it'll probably be their friends with crowbars. I mean, there's no loyalty in this crowd, not when it comes to piles of cash. Director Jerry Damiano finds that out pretty quickly. The Piranos decide to cut him out of his share of the film's profits. My father began to understand who he was dealing with. So when they made him the quote unquote offer he couldn't refuse, he felt that he was lucky to get out of there with his life. They pay him $25,000 to go away for good. They say money changes people, but that's not true. What it does is give people the means to show you who they've been all along. So who are the Perenos, really? Fat Tony is a businessman. He invests in real estate and garment companies. He runs them all just like an old school mobster. Cause that's exactly who he is. Fat Tony and Butchie, they weren't one trick ponies. They used the money that they got from Deep Throat to branch out. Butchie Perino wanted to be a filmmaker more than he wanted to be a mafioso guy. So he went to Hollywood. And he set up this film distribution company called Bryanston Films. Butchie's good at it, too. They had about 20 hits in the first year of their business. Butchie's company distributes the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Bruce Lee's Return of the Dragon, and Andy Warhol's Frankenstein. Basically, they had their fingers on the pulse of pop culture and really took some chances and made quite a bit of money on their own. It was really his niche. He would have gone on to make movies forever. You know, he was just the type of guy that that was his thing. He loved it. And as for Joe the Whale and his son, Joe Jr., they have no dreams, just appetites. Who are they really? Jerks, greedy, low-class jerks. 
It's who they've always been. And getting rich just makes that crystal clear. I think they were kind of like a white trash family who suddenly hits the lottery. You know, you buy everything. They paraded their wealth, which was not considered a good quality. Here, this is for you. And this is for them. Oh. They're just nouveau riche dumbasses. And so they weren't well thought of. So just when the Pirano brothers and their sons are showing their true colors, comes the time when they need to have each other's backs. Deep Throat might be a national sensation, but lots of people think graphic on-screen sex is obscene. Oh, we're here to execute a search warrant on the uh, premises for uh, an obscene movie. And playing it on Main Street USA causes a few run-ins with the law. The Perenos and the entire porn industry began to feel the wrath of prosecutors, you know, in the Bible Belt, who uh, went after them using obscenity laws. In 1976, things heat up when a Tennessee prosecutor gets the bright idea of charging everybody who made Deep Throat with conspiracy to violate obscenity laws, Tony and Joe Perino included. It's a big First Amendment case, and the trial becomes a media circus. It was supposed to be an obscenity trial, but in reality, it was kind of a racketeering trial where they tried to show the mob's involvement in the porn industry. Law enforcement in this, in this country was very, very upset that the mafia was making hundreds of millions of dollars off what they thought was, you know, disgusting, degrading filth. The trial showed that the Perinos were the prime movers in the porn business, that they had uh, produced and distributed Deep Throat, made millions of dollars on it, and were knee-deep in cash. And when the link between the mob and porn profits is made clear, it's an all-out scandal. Mayor Lindsay in New York City came and banned it. They pulled it out of the World Theater in Times Square, and it caused an uproar. When you face hard times together, you really get to know what somebody's made of. Shared adversity is the glue that bonds soldiers and fraternity brothers into lifelong friends. That didn't happen with the real brothers, Perino. Tony goes on the lam, leaving Brother Joe to face some music in Memphis. The blues, of course. The brothers are no longer on the same page because Anthony Perino Sr. had taken off while the Deep Throat trial was going on, and Joe the Whale took over a lot of the distribution. The trial goes badly for the Perinos and everybody else. They all get convicted, even Tony, who's hiding out in Italy or on his yacht. The Piranos appeal the conviction. But here's where the dramatic personality difference between the brothers becomes a problem. Joe the Whale and his son became the day-to-day um, the -day people who were involved in picking up the money, collecting the money, distributing the, the, the films, and basically running the show for the Colombo crime family. It seems obvious that the last person you want minding the candy store is a 500-pound gluttonous moron. But Fat Tony and Butchie have no choice. They aren't there. And anyway, the job is pretty simple. It's the two Joseph's job to make sure everybody gets their cut, Tony, Butchie, and the Colombo family bosses. I think we're pretty well established that the whale and his son are greedy nincompoops, and even their fellow mobsters are onto them. There's going to be blood on the floor, and with this bunch, that ain't a metaphor. Joe Pirano and his son, Joe Jr., think their bosses are coming to meet them to hear how much money they all made on Deep Throat last year. In fact, the only ones joining them will be a pair of shotgun-toting hitmen. How is it that two of the Colombo family's best earners are being set up for a violent end? Very 
After the Memphis trial in 76, Joe DeWale and his son are left in charge of the Pirano family business. They've never been given any responsibility before, for good reason. They're greedy and not that smart. But now the smart guys are indisposed. Fat Tony's on the run, and Butchie's fighting a losing battle to keep his Hollywood dreams alive. Unfortunately, it's exposed that Bryanston Films are the mafia, and um, basically they close up shop. So Butchie's dream of, of having a, this big Hollywood film studio gets shut down. So Tony and Butchie are counting more than ever on their share of Deep Throat's profits. But those envelopes don't seem as thick as they ought to be. Especially considering that the Memphis trial did nothing but pump up Deep Throat's box office receipts. The controversial movie Deep Throat has returned to Fort Worth once again. Most of the convictions are overturned on appeal. And thanks to the attempts to ban it, Deep Throat is bigger than ever. It actually generated more money because they gave them publicity they couldn't get anywhere else. People were starting to talk about freedom of speech and First Amendment rights and, and fighting for sexual freedom. So people wanted to be part of the sexual revolution. And because the police had tried to stop the distribution of the film, people wanted to see it. You know, when things get censored, people want to see what's the big deal. Which means the Joes are getting even more stinking rich. Fat Tony and Butchie are on the outside. And they smell a rat. Just because you're in a room with a giant pile of money, it doesn't mean it's all yours. The whale and the sun start thinking. The bosses have no idea how much they're supposed to get. Why not send them two boxes instead of, say, three or four? Oops. You know, once you're getting the money, you think, well, it's mine, you know? He's not coming back. I can just spend it any way I want. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I was Anthony Perino, I probably would have sent guys to shoot him down, too. I mean, he was pissing the money away, you know? After a couple of years on the lam, Fat Tony comes out of the cold. He's got to serve a little time, but he's OK with that. What he's not OK with is his brother playing him for a fool. When his brother came back, he wasn't too happy with the way Joe the Whale had been spending his money. Anthony Perano felt that his brother and his nephew were stealing not only from the crime family, but stealing from him. Fat Tony's prison is in California, not far from Butchie. It should be no surprise that the topic of what to do about our thieving relatives comes up now and again. He sent his son to the Colombo family hierarchy to complain that his brother was stealing money from him. Yeah, hey, Joe, thanks for coming. Okay, he said, my father wants you guys to know what's going on. He wants my Uncle Joe and my cousin Joey to pay, pay for this with their lives. The Colombo bosses are no strangers to whacking their own. For them, putting bullets in the brains of friends and colleagues is all in a day's work. The Colombo crime family has always been uh, a fractious, violent family that uh, feasted on uh, violence against uh, itself. As bad of an image as I had of the Piranos, and as much as I disliked them all, I still didn't think that they were capable of doing anything like that. I don't think that a, a human being could ever act that way, to, to go in and to put his brother and his nephew on the line and ask for their lives for, for stealing money it was unbelievable to me. The Pirano hits a weird one for sure. For fratricide or no, it seems like a good management plan. Yeah, 
the Columbo interest in the hit was money. They didn't care if they were stealing from the brother. If you're stealing from the brother, you're stealing from us. You don't go into the mafia and not know that if you do that, you're going to get whacked, you know? That's just, you know, it's like ripping off a drug dealer, you know? Like, someone's going to, you're, you're going to pay for it. The decision is made. Joe the Whale and his son are to be killed. The hit needs to be planned, of course. But how hard can it be to whack the whale? Clearly, the Colombo family reading group has not gotten around to Moby Dick. Captain Ahab, he had a hard time of it. November 1981. Joseph the Whale Pirano is ambushed in his easy chair and riddled with five 38 caliber bullets. It looks like the Colombo family's problem is taken care of. But their surprise is everybody else. They didn't order this hit. The question is, who did? So who shot the whale? Well, it wasn't the Colombos. It was Joe Jr. He's pissed off because his dad is sleeping with Jr.'s wife's mother. You can't make this stuff up. When Joe Jr. found out about it, he felt dishonored by the father, and he tried to kill him. It turns out the whale's biggest talent is absorbing lead. Now, how did the whale survive five point-blank slugs from a 38? There's a reason Ahab didn't go after Moby Dick with a handgun. There are a lot of places for a bullet to go in a wall of blubber. Junior slugs didn't hit anything vital or even important. The whale was wearing a permanent bulletproof vest, which was the two or 300 pounds of fat that he carried on his belly. When the sun shot him, the sun ran away, and the rest of the family and the people in the house decided that they would take Joe to whale and carry him outside, help him walk down the steps outside, and lay him down in the street and say that somebody tried to rob him so that the cops wouldn't know that the son tried to kill him. When the police show up to ask who shot him, the whale gives them a cock and bull story. Something about, you know, getting mugged. They thinking that it was a mob hit or something to do with the Colombo crime family. And Joe the Whale and his family stick into the story that a couple of guys had with guns try to rob him. Uh, lying to cops is protocol for any mafiosi, but lying to your bosses, that you don't do. A few days later, members of the Colombo family went to visit the Whale in the hospital and asked him what had happened. And he told the story again, that he'd been robbed by a black man, and the black man had run off. But the story had already traveled through the grapevine and gotten to the administration. Lying to mob bosses is a very bad move. When the whale tries to cover up his sleazy rolls in the hay with his son's mother-in-law, the Columbos conclude that he's a lying dirtbag. They're dirtbags too, of course, but they hate liars. And the mother-in-law thing? <laughs> Joe the Whale's skeevy sex life is actually a big worry for the Colombo bosses. They might be homicidal thugs who scoff at G-Man, but the mob is an awful lot like junior high school. And every Colombo's nightmare is a giggling Gambino. There was an ego amongst all the families. They wanted the other families to have respect for them. You know, and if they put up with some kind of behavior or nonsense like that, the other families would look down upon them, or they'd laugh behind their back. And they were very paranoid about being laughed at. So for reasons of pride and greed, the Columbos now really wanted two Joseph Piranos stuffed into oversized coffins. They were multi-offenders. Was all over the place that the son tried to kill the father, the father was messing around with his mother-in-law, it was an embarrassment for the Colombo family, really. 
And then you top it all off with Joe and his son are stealing money, and some of that money belongs to the boss. That pretty much sealed their fate. When the boss is going to wind up with more money, you're in a lot of trouble. The job calls for someone who knows them really well. Who better than their crewmate, Big Sal Michiota? I got called to a meeting uh, on Avenue U and East 4th Street. There was a social club there. And I remember, oh, geez, you know, what the f is this all about? You know, anytime I get called, come to the club, we got to talk to you. Something has to be done. And I'm going to be the one to do it. Big Sal meets with his boss, Joe Tomasello. You know, the first thing out of Joe T's mouth was, Joe Perano and his son. And I said, oh, man, why? So, well, it's a long story, but they got to go. Sal doesn't actually kill for a living. He's a loan shark. But part of the deal of being in the mob is that when the boss tells you to do a messy job, you do it. Sal had a reputation as the kind of guy, if you give him a job to kill somebody, he would get it done. Just cause you can get it done doesn't mean you like it. It was just a terrible thing. I mean, taking a life is not an easy thing to do. I'm sick that I have to be involved in it. Um, naturally, by now, I already know that I have to do whatever I'm told. Do I wind up getting killed myself? It's not an easy time. It's a very stressful situation. A little anxiety makes for a good hitman. You fuss over the details. Planning a mob hit is not as easy as you might think. Joe the Whale had already survived five slugs from his son's 38. Clearly, they'll need serious firepower. Big guys like that, you want to put them down. You know, you're looking for shots to, to knock them down, knock them off their feet. And then once they're down, you can do whatever you want with them. A shotgun with the double O buck in it, wow. Untold damage. It hits you and takes your insides right out of you. So it, that was the gun of choice. As any host knows, it's important that your guests feel comfortable. That's doubly true if you're planning to eviscerate them with shotguns. We had to think along the lines of bringing them someplace where they would be comfortable. So we figured that we would direct them to a place where they were going to meet with the administration and everything was going to be OK. The ruse is a year-end meeting to report on Deep Throat's royalties. Finding just the right location is the key thing. So Sal goes house hunting. We decided to just pick a place at random, and we looked for a spot that would appeal to all of us. We had to do it in a place and in a time where it would make them feel comfortable and they wouldn't worry about what we were going to do to them. You know, I mean, you got to remember, if anything tips them off, it's a big problem. They're not regular people. I mean, they kill us too. You know, they could just as easily kill us as we could kill them. We picked a spot that would look like it was made for this. We clocked the whole neighborhood. There was never anybody out. He finds his dream house on Lake Street in Gravesend, Brooklyn. It's a block away from a train station, and it's very noisy with the trains. He doesn't need to look inside. It's the porch he's after. Once they were on the steps, they would belong to us. I mean, there was nothing, nowhere they could go. They either had to go up or come down. And they were pretty much trapped. Sal doesn't ask the owner's permission. Why would he? I'd like to pop a pornographer on your porch can lead to some awkward questions. For example, are you going to clean it up after? In fact, lugging a dead whale back to the car is not in the plan. 
You can't kill them in a house and try to bury them. I mean, look at the size of them. One guy is 500 pounds, and the other guy is, you know, another big guy, six foot three, six foot four. No, we'll have to do it. We'll have to leave them in the street. January 4th, 1982. A car comes to the Del Rio diner and picks up Joe the Whale and Joe Jr. Father and son are still at odds over the mother-in-law attempted murder thing. But business is business. They think they're in for another dull evening of hiding income from their bosses. There will be a reckoning tonight, but the ledges have been closed. We were parked down the street. As soon as the car pulled up with them, we waited about a minute till they got like 20 feet ahead of us, 30 feet ahead of us, and we started creeping slowly in the car that we were in. It's the 11th day of Christmas, and it's time to pay the pipers. January 1982. When Joe the Whale and his son Joe Jr. arrive for their meeting with their mob bosses, everything seems hunky-dory. They had no idea what was going to happen to them because they walked up the stairs of that house like nothing was going on. They've been cheating the Colombo family and their own kin for years. As far as they know, no one has ever noticed. Now, here's the problem. The way you find out they've caught you with your hand in the cookie jar is very abrupt. The timing was perfect. When the son made us getting out of the car with the shotguns, he started running across the stoop. But it was too late for him. Your adrenaline starts taking over. You know, you have that invincible high feeling. You know, every time you do something like this, your life is on the line. I mean, cops could pull up, anything could happen. You could wind up in a shootout. You could get killed, you could get arrested. Your whole life could change in five seconds. It was a pretty, pretty precarious situation. The father never got to the door. He got shot and he laid there, never moved. We were sure that they were both dead. You know, like I was in survival mode. I wanted to get it done, get in the car, and get out of there. listening to the radio on the car, and I heard that two people were fatally wounded in Brooklyn, and there was a, a mob hit. And so I went to bed thinking, job well done. Not quite. Joe Jr. is dead. The whale, on the other hand, has survived yet again. He is not the second casualty. The second victim is Veronica Zara, a social worker and the former nun. She's who really lived at 431 Lake Street with her husband, Lewis. Veronica was bringing laundry from upstairs to downstairs, and one of the pellets of the shotgun blast hit her in the head. She fell and died instantly. Oh, man, I was, I was in shock. At first, I was sick to death. It was bad enough that I was doing these things, you know, to people in my life. But when it, a, a person that has absolutely nothing to do with this gets killed, it's devastating. Joe the Whale isn't unscathed this time. He's paralyzed. The cops hope he'll at least cough up the name of the people who murdered his son. He would never cooperate with anybody or say anything. He wouldn't say who picked him up at the diner. He, wouldn't, he wasn't talking about anything. His silence buys the Whale a pass from the Columbos who suspect that he might just be immortal. He kept his mouth shut 
and was never really targeted again by the crime family. He was happy to get out with his life and basically uh, disappear from view. News of the slaying of a former nun makes headlines. But with the whale holding his tongue, investigators get nowhere. There were no arrests. There were no suspects. There were a number of unsolved murders, and that was just one of them. Deep Throat might have changed the world of porn, but nobody involved in it ended up better off. Linda Lovelace seesaws between a porn career and anti-porn activism until she dies in a car wreck. The guy who invented the porn feature, Gerard Damiano, ends up broke in a Florida trailer park. And it was something that troubled him to the end of his life to see you know, these people that were essentially murderers make hundreds of millions of dollars where you know he did everything creatively to make this film and walked away with very little almost nothing the whale wasn't immortal he lasts a few years but complications from his wounds eventually take him to that meeting with his maker brother tony nephew butchie and the Columbos reclaim Deep Throat's revenues. But it isn't long after that, home videos come along. Porn becomes mainstream. The big profits are gone, and the Pirano family just fades into memory. Hitman Sal Michiota gets out of the mob in 1993. He takes the stand against his former gangster pals. Sal spends a few years behind bars, but he's out now. I've never seen this film, Deep Throat. I don't want to see it. To me, it's, it's absolutely nothing. It's brought nothing but trouble and heartache to a lot of people. And Big Sal counts himself as one of them. He doesn't know if it was his shot that ended the life of Veronica Zora. In the end, he knows it really doesn't matter. It's on him. And it doesn't sit well. I pray for forgiveness, and I pray for her. And she was a good person that did good for people. And I had a hand in her demise. And it kills me. And you know, I deal with it every day. It hurts me every day. <laughs> 